Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure today to welcome uh, David Hertzfeld, who uh, uh, was just remembering that many years ago, he helped me uh, put together this, this lab that you look at, the, the, these chairs, and, uh, and uh, he's been uh, an integral part of uh, the work that we did many years ago. He graduated with a PhD from, from our lab and uh, was awarded the Donald B. Lindsley Award by the Society for Neuroscience for Outstanding Research in Behavioral Neuroscience. He then went to um, Duke University where he has been a postdoc with uh, Steve Lisberger having uh, uh, been awarded the K99, K00 Award and he's out on the job market right now. Um, David uh, is a, a neuroscientist and a computational neuroscientist and a behavioral neuroscientist, and is one of the more, most careful and innovative um, young uh, uh, scientists out today. David, thank you so much for your time. Th thank you, Reza. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to, to talk to you guys today and, um, and get some feedback from you guys and hopefully engage in a discussion. I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible so that we... Um, we have time for discussion afterwards, although I will admit that it is certainly not one of my strong suits. Um, so I'll start by saying that um, one of the fundamental questions in neuroscience is how neural circuits essentially transform their inputs uh, to downstream motor areas or to downstream areas, ultimately driving uh, complex behavior. And so really answering this question has been sort of fundamental to my career in neurophysiology. But when we think about many of the tools that we use to try to address these sorts of uh, issues, many of them uh, result in us being a little bit hamstrung. Uh, for instance, we might record uh, the activity of some neurons in a population from a brain region that we're interested in, but we don't know the underlying neural identities. We could be recording excitatory neurons or inhibitory neurons uh, and really have no idea uh, essentially what sorts of populations we're recording. Similarly, in, in a lot of places, we really don't know uh, the fundamental underlying circuit architecture of this area. And so all we're left with is sort of population activity of unidentified neurons that we're forced to really correlate with the behavior that we're interested in studying. Um, and so my strategy has been to um, sort of spin this uh, normal paradigm on its head and focus on, on three sorts of things. The first is uh, you have to have behavior. If you're interested in understanding how neural circuits control behavior, you really want to start with a behavior uh, that you can measure with an incredible amount of precision. Um, and the behavior that I've always been interested in since I've been in uh, Reza's lab and then uh, my, my time in Steve's lab has been motor behavior in part because uh, we can quantify it incredibly well. And the second thing is you want a circuit that drives this behavior with a known architecture. You want to have some understanding about the underlying circuitry uh, within the area that you're recording in. And finally, you want the ability to identify populations of neurons within this area. You want to know that you're recording from this particular neuron in this uh, place in the circuit. And really, I think the, a great structure in the brain to answer these sorts of questions is uh, the cerebellum. Um, in part because it's been shown to be involved in motor execution um, in pretty much every motor domain. Uh, but even more importantly, the uh, circuit architecture of the cerebellum has been well known for over 150 years. And in addition to that known circuit architecture, there are known distinct uh, classes of cells within that overall architecture, really letting us get at that fundamental question of how a circuit might transform its inputs to ultimately drive a, a well-characterized behavior. So it, it probably needs no introduction for this audience, but uh, just to, to frame how we're gonna be talking about it, I thought I'd spend a minute going through uh, the cerebellar circuit. Um, so mossy fibers uh, arrive via extracellular, or from extracerebellar regions and synapse on granule cells. Uh, the axons of granule cells form parallel fibers, um, which serve as a, a primary excitatory input to Purkinje cells. And Purkinje cells represent the sole output of the cerebellar cortex. Uh, they're inhibitory neurons, um, and they synapse on downstream neurons in the cerebellar nucleus. Uh, and these uh, neurons then, of course, go on to affect uh, downstream targets. So this mossy fiber to Purkinje cell pathway forms essentially the primary feedforward pathway by which information comes in and then is ultimately relayed out of the cerebellum. Um, but in addition to this pathway, uh, there's many other cell types. Uh, this is just an abbreviated version of the circuit that I'm showing you here. Uh, 
Um, you have Golgi cells and unipolar brush cells and molecular layer interneurons, uh, all of which serve to modulate the activity in this feed forward pathway and thereby affect the transformation of inputs to outputs. In addition to this known architecture, uh, a really beautiful characteristics, uh, characteristic of the neurophysiology of the cerebellum is that Purkinje cells not only receive these uh, parallel fiber inputs, but they also receive a climbing fiber input uh, from the inferior olive, one climbing fiber input per Purkinje cell. And that's interesting because when you record from these Purkinje cells extracellularly, they exhibit two different types of action potentials. The first is what we call simple spikes, the action potentials uh, that you might record from just about any other neuron in the brain. Um, and these are driven by intrinsic activity as well as the excitatory input from parallel fibers. But then every once in a while, about one to two hertz, uh, a climbing fiber will fire and result in a postsynaptic action potential with a rather complicated waveform uh, that we call a complex spike. Um, and so just due to the fact that you can record simple and complex spikes, lets us know uh, that we're recording from potentially a Purkinje cell. But to really be sure, uh, what we do is we look at what's called the cross correlogram between the climbing fiber activity uh, and the simple spike activity for this Purkinje cell. And we're gonna be looking at quite a few cross correlograms today. So I'm gonna spend just a, a little bit of extra time going through this one. Um, and so what we're plotting here on the X axis is the time of a complex spike, uh, which occurs at T equals zero. So a complex spike uh, has been aligned to T equals zero. And what we're plotting on the Y axis is the simple spike firing rate of this Purkinje cell as a function of time aligned to this complex spike. And what you see here is that the Purkinje cell clips along in this case around 40 Hertz. The climbing fiber uh, results in a complex spike at T equals zero. The simple spikes pause for a period of tens of milliseconds. In this case, there's a little bit of rebound activity and then it returns firing at about 40 milliseconds. And this pause following the complex spike lets us know that we're essentially recording uh, the complex spike activity and the simple spike activity from a single Purkinje cell. And this is really powerful because combined with the circuit, we now know um, the identity of a subset of neurons, the Purkinje cells that represent the sole output of this computation. And so our broad goal today is to begin to answer the question, how does the cerebellar circuit transform mossy fiber inputs into Purkinje cell outputs? Um, and I wanna give you a little bit of a roadmap for how we're gonna get there because it's gonna take us through some twists and turns. Um, so the first thing we need to talk about is uh, we need to be able to understand what the output of the cerebellar circuit is. What are the codes uh, that Purkinje cells communicate to downstream areas with? Because if the code, um, for instance, is a rate-based code or some other code, that's going to inform how we want to analyze the upstream uh, activity of these other sorts of neuron types. Um, so the, we're first going to use the fact that we can identify these Purkinje cells uh, to understand how they're transmitting information to downstream neurons in the cerebellum nucleus. The second is we need to be able to link extracellular properties um, with uh, underlying neuron identities. We need to be able to stick an electrode in the cerebellum and ask or, or assay whether or not this particular electrophysiological signature that we're recording corresponds to, for instance, a Golgi cell versus a molecular layer interneuron versus a Purkinje cell. And finally, once we have those pieces of information, we can use uh, the, the cerebellar circuit combined with a region that is crucially responsible for behavior. The behavior I'm gonna be talking about today is called smooth pursuit eye movements, which we'll go through in just a second. Um, and we're gonna use that to understand how mossy fibers are ultimately transformed through this cerebellar circuit. Okay, so let's start with the first question, which is what is the nature of the information transmission out of the cerebellar cortex? So um, just a, a little bit more anatomy, um, approximately 40 to 50 Purkinje cells that share similar complex spike or climbing fiber responses project to a single neuron in the deep cerebellar nuclei. Um, and so uh, these are called uh, a microzone in the literature. And uh, so there's many mechanisms by which information could be transmitted. One is uh, via typical rate-based codes, which are, um, predominant in many regions of the brain, or potentially via a synchronous code. And uh, there's some really beautiful evidence of Purkinje cells uh, potentially being able to transmit a synchrony code uh, by wonderful work by Abigail Person and Indira Raman. Um, and so I'm gonna take a moment to just go through uh, this plot here. So what we're plotting for you is the response of a neuron in the cerebellar nucleus, the CN neuron. 
And they're going to be using dynamic clamp experiments to modulate both the firing rate of the Purkinje cells and the amount of synchrony that's present in these Purkinje cells. And I'm going to denote that using this raster. Each one of these uh, dots corresponds to a single Purkinje cell. And what you see here is that in these dynamic clamp experiments, essentially as Purkinje cell firing rate increases, uh, the cerebellar nucleus neuron decreases its firing uh, ever so slightly up to 120 hertz. Um, and so that, that's expected, I think, because the Purkinje cells are inhibitory on neurons in the cerebellar nuclei. But what's interesting is while keeping rates the same, as uh, Indira and Abby increased the amount of synchrony in their population, notice the fraction of rasters that look exactly the same here. Um, as they increase the amount of synchrony, what happens is that these Purkinje or these downstream cerebellar nuclei neurons uh, begin to fire more. And in fact, they begin to fire at uh, magnitudes that are approximately equal to the rate that was pre programmed into the Purkinje cells. Um, and so, what this suggests is that. Uh, synchrony of upstream Purkinje cells could be transmitted to downstream cerebellar nucleus neurons. Um, and, and this is in part because of the uh, brief uh, periods of uh, pausing, essentially, where all of these Purkinje cells pause together and allow the cerebellar nucleus neuron to fire um, essentially in tandem. And so we want to address the question of whether or not Purkinje cells synchronize their firing in vivo. And if so, does this Purkinje cell tr synchrony transmit relevant information to downstream neurons. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use a multi-contact electrode, in this case, a Plexon S probe, to record simultaneous pairs of Purkinje cells. And so here's a, one example of a Purkinje cell aligned to its complex spike activity. So you see this nice pause in the simple spikes uh, following this complex spike, similar for PC2. I hope you guys can see those uh, simple spike responses. We can plot their uh, simple spike, complex spike cross correlogram. So we know that these complex spikes and simple spikes come from the same Purkinje cells. We can plot their autocorrelograms. These are just uh, the probability of a simple spike occurring um, at any time t, given that one occurred at t equals zero. And you see these very characteristic Purkinje cell autocorrelograms. But the real question now is whether or not PC1 and PC2 fire simple spikes simultaneously together? Are they synchronous? Um, and so to address that question, we align to now a simple spike uh, in PC1 and ask whether or not there's an increased probability of firing a simple spike in PC2. And we see in that this particular example, uh, there is not. And we can summarize that activity using again a cross correlogram here plotting the firing rate of PC2 aligned to a, a spike from PC1. And what you see is that there's no peak at t equals zero, which would be indicative of highly synchronous within a millisecond simple spike responses. But what you will notice is that there is this sort of triangular shaped um, cross correlogram, sort of like a slow roll off uh, as the time uh, from PC1 spike increases. And this is undoubtedly due to the fact that PC1 and PC2 are modulating their firing rates. Um, and really, we're not interested in modulation of firing rates when we're talking about synchrony. And so what we really want to do is remove any uh, artifact that might exist due to modulation of firing rates. And to do that, we essentially statistically jitter the timing of PC2 spikes, resulting in a null hypothesis that the exact timing of PC2 spikes doesn't matter. It's just the rate-based component. And then we subtract off that null hypothesized uh, component, CCG. And I'm happy to go through this uh, in a lot more depth uh, in the discussion if people have questions. Um, but essentially what you end up with is a rate-corrected cross-correlogram. So this is uh, plotting it in units of change in probability, but you could plot it in the same units uh, of firing rate simply by multiplying by the bin size. Here uh, it's one millisecond, so mentally multiply by a thousand. So what you see is by removing the confound of rate, we see once again that there is no, uh, no high level of synchrony at t equals zero, uh, but now we have essentially a flat curve. We don't have this confound of rate. Okay, so this was just one example. What happens when we look at uh, our complete population? Uh, so in this case, we can look at 32 pairs of confirmed Purkinje cells, and perhaps slightly unlike the example that I showed you previously, what we see is that across these 32 pairs of Purkinje cells, what you do see is uh, a tendency for a peak at t equals zero. So when neuron one or when Purkinje cell one fires, Purkinje cell two has a slightly increased probability of firing. 
by about uh, 0 0.0024. Um, and so what does that mean? Um, that, that's sort of not a really intuitive um, measure. So how often does this actually occur in vivo? Um, so what we've, what we've actually measured is the probability of Purkinje cell two firing given that Purkinje cell one firing. That's, that's this peak here, it's 0 0.0024. So the probability of an unexpected spike from PC2 happening in the same bin as PC1. Um, but what we really want is the probability of Purkinje cell two firing at the same time as Purkinje cell one in an unexpected way uh, or in a way that would be unexpected given the firing rates. And in fact, that's uh, really simple to compute. It's just this joint probability that we measured above multiplied by the probability of Purkinje cell one firing. And so this was 0 0.0024. And this is uh, the mean firing rate of Purkinje cell one, which happens across our population of 32 pairs to be about 48 spikes per second. And so what you end up with is that uh, Purkinje cell one and Purkinje cell two fire synchronous spikes together, i.e. simple spikes in the same millisecond in time only about at, at a rate about one spike per every 10 seconds. And this seems like uh, quite a small amount of synchrony uh, that might be transmitted to downstream neurons. But all of this analysis um, has been done on just sort of random samples of Purkinje cells, ones that we happen to, to record together. But what you see is that if you look at the data and this corroborates some previous studies on synchrony and Purkinje cells, uh, that as distance decreases between pairs, that is as the, the probability uh, or as the distance between these pairs decreases, we see a slight increase in the probability of observing synchrony. Um, and so it, it, it's possible that uh, really synchrony exists within only a localized subset of Purkinje cells, perhaps even only Purkinje cells that say, share the same microzone that essentially project to the same neuron in the downstream nucleus. Um, and so uh, what we wanted to do is test that hypothesis. Maybe it's only within these microzones that you see synchrony. And we actually had a population of about five Purkinje cells that received or responded paused to the same climbing fiber input, same complex spike. And what we wanted to know is whether or not we see increased synchrony here. These happen to be very close together. They happen to have the same climbing fiber inputs. Uh, but we see uh, across an example pair and across this population of five pairs, um, it's quite noisy, but the overall magnitude of synchrony is approximately the same as what would be expected given their distance, which is, again, very, very small. Um, so it doesn't appear like uh, microzone uh, contribute significantly to synchrony across PC pairs. But of course, uh, all of this data has been uh, performed over the course of an entire experimental session. The animal is actually performing behavior. We're just looking at cross correlograms uh, across essentially the entire uh, duration of the recording. And it's certainly possible that Purkinje cells might preferentially synchronize or desynchronize their behavior, their uh, simple spike responses only during behavior. Um, and so the behavior that we're interested in in Steve's lab is a behavior called smooth pursuit. And uh, just in case Zoom is not working, um, the, the behavior is very, very simple. The animal looks at a dot on the screen and the target or dot moves smoothly at a constant velocity uh, in one of eight directions. So if your animation did not move smoothly, that was Zoom's fault. Uh, in the experiments, it actually moves smoothly. Um, and we measured the animal's eye position and their eye velocity as a function of time. Um, and we know that uh, the cerebellum, and in particular, uh, a subregion of the cerebellum called the flocular complex, and even beyond that, a sub subregion of the flocular complex called the ventral paraflocculus is crucially involved in this behavior uh, because lesions of that ventral paraflocculus results in deficits in pursuit, and similarly, stimulation of the ventral paraflocculus results in the initiation of smooth pursuit eye movements. So we're going to ask now if Purkinje cells preferentially synchronize in the ventral paraflocculus during pursuit. Um, and so here's our example of a pursuit trial. Um, so this is the velocity on the bottom and the position on the top. Um, and we can plot um, the preferred, the average response of Purkinje cells in their preferred direction, which is called uh, the simple spike on or SS on direction. And what you see is that they tend to look a lot like the eye velocity. They increase their activity at the onset of target motion and then set, sort of steadily decline over the course of the pursuit trial. Um, and so uh, we see the exact opposite in the SS off direction. Um, you see that there are decrements in behavior. And crucially, across populations of Purkinje cells in the flocculus, the flocculus is a lateralized structure. Um, and so there's uh, 
and anis anisotropy uh, in the preferred directions of Purkinje cells in that they prefer pursuit towards the ipsiversive and downwards direction. And what that means is if we grab any two pairs of Purkinje cells, chances are their preferred directions are relatively close to one another. In fact, the circular mean uh, is relatively close to zero. And what that suggests is that if we are moving in the preferred direction of Purkinje cell one, the first Purkinje cell under study, chances are we're very close to the preferred direction of Purkinje cell two as well. So they might increase their activity in tandem. Um, and so if we plot the probability of Purkinje cell one firing in the same millisecond as Purkinje cell two as a function of pursuit trials, we see uh, essentially exactly that. There, there's an increase in the activity, the likelihood of seeing simultaneous Purkinje cells, simple spikes, and the opposite case uh, in SS off. And so we want to know how much of this is due just to the fact that these uh, units are responding to the same direction of preferred pursuit, um, and how much of it is due to actual synchrony that might be unexpected given the rates. Um, and again, we can form our null hypotheses, which is the black line. That's what would be expected on average uh, based on the rate responses of these units, uh, removing all uh, effects of timing in the simple spike responses, and subtraction on a pair by pair basis of uh, the blue curve minus the black curve results in a, in a within pair corrected synchrony measure that is above zero. So these cells are more synchronous than they would be uh, given chance but it's relatively unmodulated by either the direction of pursuit or really any other metric that we were able to discover. Um, and so what that suggests is that it doesn't seem like Purkinje cells preferentially synchronize their behavior during movement. But to really hopefully put the nail in the coffin, um, we uh, worked with Mati Joshua, um, who, uh, who recorded some of this data in uh, Steve Lisberger's lab, where he implanted a bipolar stimulating electrode in the cerebellar cortex. Um, and could stimulate Purkinje cells while recording from neurons in the downstream cerebellar nucleus. In this case, the cerebellar nucleus is the vestibular nucleus, and we call the monosynaptic targets of Purkinje cells FTNs, or flocular target neurons. And so while recording in the vestibular nucleus, he can identify cells that show uh, short latency monosynaptic inhibition, uh, indicative of receiving inputs directly from Purkinje cells. Um, and so what we see is that when if we plot the Purkinje cell firing rates and the FTN firing rates, you notice something uh, immediate. And that is that if the animal moves in the subversive direction, Purkinje cells increase their activity and in FTNs decrease their activity. And that's because the preferred directions of uh, Purkinje cells and downstream neurons, FTNs, are exactly opposite each other, which is perhaps what would be expected given this is an inhibitory synapse. And you see exactly the opposite in the controversive direction. Um, and so then we asked, do we need synchrony to predict the responses of FTNs or can we use rate-based inputs alone? And so what I'm doing here is uh, plotting the responses of those FTNs now split by direction. And we're gonna ask whether or not the rate responses of Purkinje cells uh, can form a, a simple linear, weighted linear combination to predict the responses of FTNs. So this W uh, implies uh, here that this is strictly non-negative uh, least squares. So we're only letting the Purkinje cell weights be positive, and this negative sign means their net effect on FTN firing is negative. Um, and this uh, trivial model with 40 Purkinje cells uh, randomly selected results in R squareds here of uh, greater than 0.96. So it really seems like the rate-based responses of a population of 40 Purkinje cells can really predict the rate-based responses of downstream neurons in the FTNs. We don't seem to need to invoke synchrony to do that. Um, so let me uh, summarize uh, what I've said so far. Uh, and that's that simultaneous recordings of Purkinje cells, at least in our hands in the flocculus, show little to no synchrony with an average rate about one every uh, 10 or so seconds. During pursued eye movement, the probability of synchronous spikes appears temporally unmodulated and largely predicted by firing rate changes. And downstream neurons, uh, FTNs in the vestibular nucleus, that receive monosynaptic inhibitory inputs from Purkinje cells appear to be well modeled by the weighted response of upstream Purkinje cell uh, rates uh, without the need to invoke any synchrony to, to perform that transmission. So, so now that we have an understanding of the, the code uh, that the flocculus is using to output to downstream neurons in the FTN, our goal then is to work backwards, basically from the Purkinje cells to identify how the circuit is eventually resulting, up, uh, resulting in the Purkinje cell rate-based responses during pursuit. Uh, 
Um, but of course, in order to do that, we need a way to label uh, all of the other cells that we have um, beyond the Purkinje cells in order to understand how this circuit computes. Okay, so what we do is we're going to be recording extracellular uh, signals uh, from multi-contact electrodes. And what we really want to do is be able to link the properties of these extracellular recordings to their underlying neuron identities in the circuit. And when you think about how we might do that, um, you, I, I think you'll end up with about four uh, pieces of information that we have. So the first is that you get that fraction of unambiguously identified Purkinje cells, those with the simple and complex spike uh, related pauses. Uh, but those represent a, a relative minority actually of the signals that you're going to be recording in the cerebellum. And so uh, as would be true in just about any brain area, the really only other pieces of information you might have have something to do with the shape of the action potential waveform and the resting discharge properties of that cell, i.e. its intrinsic regularity. Um, and so uh, a reasonable question then is, well, if we can identify a fraction of unambiguously identified Purkinje cells, do they all have the same shape? Do they all have something similar about their resting discharge properties? That would give us a clue that maybe across these other populations, maybe molecular layer interneurons also have a particular signature in their action potential waveform and resting discharge properties. And we can use that information to label unlayered neurons. Um, in addition, in the cerebellum, we have this extra piece of information, the cerebellar layer, which while sometimes ambiguous, is incredibly informative uh, in predicting uh, the labels for unlabeled neurons. So I'm going to go through each of these uh, in turn, but we're going to start with this fraction of unambiguously identified Purkinje cells and ask whether the shape and resting discharge properties are consistent within a class of neurons. So here, for instance, are about 110 Purkinje cells. These are known Purkinje cells that have uh, complex spike pauses. And what I'm plotting for you um, in a transparent trace are all of the action potential waveforms uh, on the primary contact. And what you see is that there's a lot of heterogeneity, but really there's an area where the banding of these uh, action potential waveforms look like they overlap a great deal. And certainly that appears to be the case when you compare it to a randomly selected uh, uh, equal size population of other neurons uh, recorded from the cerebellum. You see that there's not really these thick bands. Similarly, if you look at something about the regularity properties, in this case, we're going to look at the autocorrelogram. Uh, so again, the, the probability of a neuron firing at time t, given that it fired at t equals zero. So these are the simple spikes. You see that in a, across these uh, multiple Purkinje cells, you see that there are these very lobed structures in the autocorrelogram. And that's certainly true um, or consistent, certainly compared to, a, a, again, a random uh, sampling. So it looks like within a class of known cells, waveform and regularity properties are consistent. And so maybe we can use these as, uh, as uh, exemplars for other neural populations. So how might we do that? Um, well, so let's take one example of how we work through this logically. So here we have a Purkinje cell firing along, and we know it's a Purkinje cell because it pauses in relation to a complex spike here occurring at t equals zero. We've recorded this cell, but in addition, simultaneously, we've also recorded many other neurons in the cerebellar cortex. And we can ask whether or not the firing of some unknown neuron, some, uh, some neuron that we don't have a label, uh, modulates the firing of this known Purkinje cell uh, with some consistency. And most often, the answer is no. Um, in fact, there's no effect of this other neuron on Purkinje cell firing. But once in a while, what you'll see is that um, if you plot a cross correlogram where you align now at t equals zero the spike of the unknown neuron and you plot the Purkinje cell simple spike response, what you see is sometimes you see this monosynaptic pause in Purkinje cell activity uh, occurring just after the, the other unknown unit fires. Um, and you see that in this particular case, the Purkinje cell simple spikes rebound and return back to their baseline firing rate. So we can uh, sort of putatively assign a, a label to this unknown neuron and say it's more than likely a class of molecular layer interneurons, the primary inhibitory uh, cell type uh, that acts on Purkinje cells. And if we do this many, 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 many times, what we can get is a library of molecular layer interneuron templates and molecular layer interneuron autocorrelograms that we could potentially use to classify molecular layer interneurons uh, that don't necessarily have a significant cross-correlogram with a known Purkinje cell. 
Um, and you can take the same logic and really apply it uh, moving backwards throughout the cerebellar cortex to assign a fraction of units with uh, their known uh, with putative labels um, and use that to uh, assign labels potentially to other units that don't necessarily have these functional properties. And finally, in the cerebellum, we also have additional benefits uh, in that the cerebellar cortex is a layered structure. And again, this probably needs no introduction for this audience, but essentially the Purkinje cells form a beautiful Purkinje cell layer. You have the granule cell layer where these uh, dense clusters of cells, and then uh, the molecular layer, which is, uh, is cell body sparse. Uh, and each of these layers corresponds to a particular uh, set of cells or a set of electrophysiological signals that you might measure. And of course, you can use that to narrow down uh, the putative identity of uh, particular cells that you're recording. And of course, I'll say that it, oftentimes this is ambiguous. Um, here, I'll show you uh, an example that's entirely non-ambiguous recorded uh, from uh, the cerebellar flocculus. So here's how we can do this manually. Uh, what you see hopefully right off the bat is the beautiful complex spike responses, which of course don't wanna show up for me. There we go. All right, complex spike responses. Uh, here, the pause uh, following the complex spikes in these action potentials, which means this is a Purkinje cell. Um, and so this must be the Purkinje cell layer. Here you see the complex spike responses absent the, the simple spike responses. And indeed, these are turning into what we call fat spikes, um, which is indicative of molecular layers. And then, of course, these other um, layers are then uh, the granule cell layer. And again, sometimes this is uh, ambiguous. So, okay, so once we have all of that information and putative cell identities, what we then turn to is machine learning, where we insert waveform regularity properties for all these putatively identified uh, units and layer if we have it and train the network to predict uh, the responses of withheld units. Um, and what you see here is uh, an example. Um, uh, this is a confusion matrix. So what you really want is 100% accuracy on these diagonals. You see that even in this, um, uh, even in this subset, the, for pretty much everything except for molecular layer interneurons, um, it's doing an incredibly good job of predicting the responses, having only the waveform and regularity and potentially layer properties. Um, but one sort of confound of this approach, um, which you, you quickly realize when you're recording from the flocculus, uh, is, is what I'm going to talk about right now. So this is an example cell. Uh, it's recorded in the granule cell layer. Uh, we know that for this cell. And we're going to have the animal do a, an incredibly simple task. Essentially, we put a dot on the screen, and the animal's sole job is to just look at the dot. So it's just fixating the dot for a period of seconds. And when we do that, this particular cell uh, fires a lot when the animal is fixating to one of these three points that are down at the bottom of the visual field, and essentially fires not at all when the animal is looking up. And if we plot the autocorrelogram of this unit when the animal is looking down, what we see is that indeed the firing rate is high, about 40 to 50 spikes per second. But the, you see these lobe structures indicative of highly regular firing for this particular unit. I want to contrast that with the autocorrelogram for when the animal is looking just at zero degrees, right in line um, with the center of their orbit. And what you see is that indeed the firing rate has decreased to about 20 spikes per second but it's no longer highly regular. In fact, the, the amount of regularity has gone down significantly. And if we were to just average across all of the locations in space that the animal is looking, we would get an average ACG that looks like this, which is a muted version essentially of all of the ACGs that we measured. And that's because the regularity properties of this unit uh, are changing as a function of its firing rate. So in order to combat that problem, what we've done is essentially come up with a new way to plot the autocorrelogram, and that's binned by the instantaneous firing rate of the neuron at t equals zero. And so here, imagine that the animal was looking down uh, at minus 10. It's this highly regular portion. Uh, what we can do is we can bin that and say that the, the mean firing rate at t equals zero is around 60, 50, 60 hertz. And we can plot the autocorrelogram in three dimensions where the Z dimension is the instantaneous firing rate, essentially the same plot that we're making up here. Similarly, we can do that for uh, essentially when the animal is looking up or has a firing rate that's relatively low at 20 uh, spikes per second. And then we can fill it in in the middle. And what you see is that there's this sort of beautiful mosaic uh, 
of responses where the um, CB2 or the regularity properties of this neuron is dramatically changing as a function of its firing rate, which would not be fully appreciated had we just taken essentially the marginal of this. Um, and indeed, if you look across different cell types, uh, Purkinje cells and molecular layer interneurons, they all show really beautiful and rather distinct uh, 3D autocorrelograms. And when we apply this uh, to our machine learning network here using a convol convolutional neural network as input to our classifier, what we see is that we get exquisite performance uh, with a mean accuracy of about 94% using uh, withheld uh, samples. Um, and so really, I think this is a, a beautiful uh, way to look at firing of cells in the cerebellum. Um, and it, it suggests that the extracellular properties of these waveforms are unique and capable of predicting um, the classes of uh, cell types that you might record within the cerebellar cortex. So in the cerebellum, these different neuron types appear to exhi exhibit different waveform and regularity properties. And using the CCGs of known neurons, for instance, Purkinje cells, provides us evidence for assigning putative labels. And then using uh, machine learning, we can begin to um, assign labels to unknown units with relatively high accuracy. Um, so I should say that we are part of a broad collaboration with uh, Mike Heuser's group uh, at UCL, Court Hall's group uh, at Duke, and Javier Medina's group at Baylor, um, where really we're taking uh, sort of the opposite approach that we took here, using ground truth optotagging in mice to build this classifier and then use it uh, to predict not only uh, unknown neurons or unknown cerebellar neurons within the mouse, but also uh, unknown neurons uh, within the monkey. And it turns out, at least preliminarily, that uh, it, it actually tends to agree a lot with, uh, in, or in large part, with the results that I'm showing you today. And so what I'm going to uh, show you here now are the, the sort of waveforms of some canonical units within the cerebellum. They're very nice, very pretty, sort of uh, within class, uh, very homogeneous. Uh, but what you'll quickly notice is that I'm not showing you the data for one particular cell type, and that's the granule cell. Um, and that's in large part because across essentially this collaboration, as well as in our own lab, uh, we really find limited evidence that we can record granule cells um, using the types of probes that we're recording. And so really this sort of hamstrings us in order to try to, try to figure out uh, how the circuit is uh, performing, uh, in part because we don't have this sort of crucial hub within the cerebellar circuit. Uh, and I'm going to go through in the last five minutes or so how we might uh, be able to do that um, using other tricks uh, and behavioral techniques. So we're going to now ask, uh, given these known cell types, how the cerebellar circuit contributes to smooth pursuit eye movements. So here again is our smooth pursuit uh, eye movement trial. Um, and if we plot uh, the Purkinje cell simple spike responses in their preferred or SS on direction, you see that, uh, as we showed before, they, are, they look a lot like the eye velocity. And in fact, you can um, make a linear combination of eye velocity and eye position where velocity uh, contributes the bulk of um, the, the firing rate responses of these Purkinje cells. And I wanna contrast that with mossy fibers recorded in this exact same task where uh, their response really looks like either an equal uh, weighted contribution of position and velocity or really uh, across uh, individual cells, heavily biased uh, more towards velocity. And so what we've resulted with is sort of a canonical computation. Somehow the cerebellum has to go from position and velocity sensitive mossy fibers to really velocity uh, only sensitive Purkinje cells. Somewhere either the position has to be differentiated or it needs to be canceled out in order to get the Purkinje cell responses. And so I'm gonna lead you uh, through three potential hypotheses for how that could occur. Um, the first is that maybe parallel fibers uh, fire as position and velocity, just like the mossy fibers do. So, so granule cells fire exactly the same uh, as, um, as their mossy fiber inputs. And then maybe molecular layer interneurons are uh, predominantly tuned to position, and then they just serve to use feed forward subtraction to subtract off that position signal, resulting in a Purkinje cell with strong velocity. We don't think that that's the case in large part because molecular layer interneurons actually are even more strongly tuned for eye velocity than the Purkinje cells. So it doesn't seem like they're responding in a feed forward manner to position and then subtracting that position signal off. Alternatively, that sort of feed forward subtraction could happen a little bit further upstream at the level of the granule cells. And here, maybe Golgi cells are position tuned, subtract that position signal off. Now you get nicely velocity tuned parallel fibers, 
serves as the input to both molecular layer interneurons and Purkinje cells, both of which I've shown you are velocity tuned. So this seems to make a lot of sense, except that Golgi cells, if anything, are tuned for velocity. And really uh, look at the scales here. They're, they're sort of lacklusterly tuned uh, in terms of rate, uh, regardless, uh, in their preferred direction, only responding at about one uh, additional spike per second. There's many other interesting things about Golgi cells. Um, but it, at least in terms of their rate responses, they're, they're wholly uh, uninteresting in our hands. And so the, the third potential mechanism is that something about the granule cells themselves David, we lost your connection. Whoops. Um, not sure. Let's see if we can get him back. They must have crashed. Sorry about that, guys. Looks like something might have crashed on David's side. Hopefully, he'll be right back with us. So hang in there. There he is. David, you're muted. Hopefully, you can hear me now. When did we? When did we stop? <laughs> just, 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 just about thirty seconds ago. Okay. <laughs> exactly what you want um <laughs> no problem let's see where did my zoom go share screen share all right sorry guys i have google fiber it has never gone down before all right so did we see golgi cells uh, I think we were right here, yeah. Right here. Begin I'll start over at the beginning of the slide. Um, of course, it's now on the wrong screen. Screen share. That one. All right, sorry guys. Um, so uh, potentially parallel fibers could be positioned and velocity tuned. Um, molecular layer interneurons, if they're strongly position tuned, could serve as a feed forward uh, inhibition of position and resulting in nice Purkinje cell velocity responses. This turns out not to be the case, uh, in part because molecular layer interneurons appear uh, much more strongly velocity tuned than even Purkinje cells. Um, an alternative uh, situation could be that Golgi cells um, are position tuned. They subtract off their position responses again via feed forward inhibition, resulting in predominantly velocity tuned granule cell responses, which then uh, serve as the velocity responses of molecular layer interneurons and Purkinje cells. Um, at least in our hands, this doesn't appear to be the case. Uh, Golgi cells, if anything, are velocity tuned, uh, but look at the scale here. In fact, they're very poorly rate tuned at all, only responding in their preferred direction by about one spike per second. So it doesn't appear to be Golgi cells either. So where is this transformation happening? Well, really the last spot that we thought about is at the granule cell synapse within intrinsic mechanisms of the granule cells or in their mossy fiber to granule cell projections, in which case uh, granule cells would already be velocity tuned and supply this velocity based input to molecular layer interneurons and other cell types. Um, of course, this would be really easy to test if we had you know, recorded granule cells uh, which I already told you, uh, we're pretty sure that we don't, certainly not in high numbers. Um, and so how can we go about uh, testing this hypothesis that granule cells are velocity tuned? And so uh, we really turn to a technique um, that I came across when I was a graduate student in Reza's lab, uh, Reza being sort of a, a fantastic pioneer of this approach. 
um, and it's called behavioral generalization. And it's a way to use behavioral responses to infer something about uh, the structure of neuron responses within the brain. Um, and so in this particular case, we can imagine that granule cells are, for instance, velocity tuned. They might be, they might not be. Um, and their axons, parallel fibers, uh, form a weighted uh, input to Purkinje cells, as we might imagine. Um, but if we could selectively manipulate the weights of these uh, parallel fibers and then modulate the activity of these granule cells along their tuned axis, for instance, modulate the speed of the animal's eye movement, then we could record a change in behavior, a learned response passed through this layer of plasticity, this set of weighted, uh, newly weighted synapses, and measure the behavioral response and infer something about the upstream uh, tuning of these granule cell responses. Um, and hopefully this will be a little bit clearer in just a second when we go through the example. So what we're gonna do is use a motor learning task to induce plasticity ideally at the parallel fiber at the Purkinje cell synapse, and then probe behavioral generalization. Um, and so we do that in a monkey by exposing them to a smooth pursuit learning trial where the animal tracks a target moving in a particular direction, and then the target deviates in a completely new direction uh, via an orthogonal velocity component. And that looks a little bit like this. So here's the instruction or what we call this uh, onset of this deviant um, or orthogonal velocity component. And what's interesting about this task is not necessarily the learning trial, but what happens if you ask the animal to make an eye movement in that initial pursuit direction on the very next trial. What happens is that the animal's eye movement is biased at the time of the instruction in the previous trial. It shows a learned response and attempt to compensate for the fact that the target uh, moved in a deviant direction and the animal had a retinal slip signal uh, at that onset of the instruction. And we know quite a bit about uh, the neural mechanisms of this. Uh, see, for instance, uh, Javier's uh, paper uh, with Steve in 2008, a beautiful example of how we think the parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapse is plasticized due to com uh, complex spike responses. Um, and so here I'm just showing you the complex spikes, uh, which are tuned uh, in this case for uh, direction of the retinal slip. And so really we believe that we can uh, change the, the weights predominantly in this parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapse via this heterosynaptic plasticity. And so what we're going to do then is imagine an experimental paradigm in which we expose a monkey to a learning trial in trial N, we get a change in weights, uh, a decrement in the weights of active parallel fibers. And then on the next trial, we're gonna modify something about uh, the statistics of the task. And in this case, we're going to start by asking the animal to make an eye movement in 20 degree, at, at 20 degrees per second, which turns out to be the same speed uh, as the learning trial. And so we can measure the learned response. It's nicely Gaussian, peaks around 1.5 degrees per second. So this is just the learned response in a single trial due to a single instruction as measured on a probe trial in the very next trial of 20 degrees. And what we can do is then modify the speed of the probe trial, instantiate learning in trial N, and then choose at random a speed, 5, 10, 15, or 20 degrees per second of the next trial in the probe trial. And if uh, parallel fibers, granule cells, were predominantly velocity tuned, then what we might ex Oh, no. Hopefully he'll come right back. Okay, we can see you. Oh man, all right. Now I'm streaming from my phone. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully that works. All right, screen sharing. It's the last slide anyway. This is this is what you want. All right, screen. It's worth the wait. Sorry, all. We were going to have lots of time for questions. So the idea then is that if parallel fibers are are uh, velocity tuned, passing those change in speed through the weights 
uh, that we instantiated in that learning trial would result in an ultimate change in behavior that is also linearly tuned uh, for the speed of the animal's eye movement. Alternatively, if parallel fibers are predominantly position tuned, uh, then what we might expect is that it takes longer when you move slower to reach the site uh, where we instantiated plasticity because uh, the target and the animal's eye is moving slower. And so then we might expect a delay in the onset of this learned response in behavior. And that uh, when we look at the actual behavioral responses, we see that they are incredibly well-timed and linearly uh, responsive uh, to the change in the animal's eye speed in the probe trial. And so then our thought is that uh, the granule cells are indeed predominantly velocity tuned uh, as opposed to uh, position two. So let me just summarize uh, in our conclusions. Um, so we, we showed that simultaneous recordings of Purkinje cells seem to show little to no synchrony, um, and that the lack of synchrony um, code suggests that firing rates are probably the primary uh, output of the cerebellar cortex, at least in the flocculus. Um, in the cerebellum, uh, different neurons appear to exhibit unique extracellular properties, including waveform properties and regularity properties, allowing machine learning algorithms to disambiguate neuron identities from these properties. And in the cerebellar flocculus, we're using labeled cell types along with smooth pursuit eye movements uh, to determine uh, how the local cerebellar circuit transforms its inputs. And then characterization of the flocular responses uh, during uh, smooth pursuit adaptation seems to suggest that the transformation from position velocity to velocity dominant responses occurs at the level of the granule cells, uh, such that Purkinje cells are responsive uh, primarily to high velocity. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll thank uh, the people uh, who really helped contribute to this work, Steve Lisberger, Mati Joshua, Nathan Hall, who spent uh, a postdoc in the lab, who spent uh, many years designing uh, the spike sorter that we use to assay synchrony, um, our monkeys um, and NIH funding. And with that, I will uh, happily take any questions, comments, discussions, and uh, woefully apologize for my lack of uh, stable internet. Oh, that was great. Thank you so much, David. That was just wonderful. Um, let's open it up and let's see, let's see if there are questions for David. Looks like lots of people are clapping. Um, David, um, I guess I'll, I'll get started. David, if you, if you could um, generalize from the, na the nature of computation that you are seeing, and I'm, I'm a little confused because it seems like the mossy fibers are already providing this part of the cerebellum with position and velocity information, and the simple spikes that are coming from the Purkinje cells are just providing velocity. So what, what, is, what is being computed by the cerebellum? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think you know that's the that's the million dollar question, Reza, because um, it's bizarre, right? Why would uh, mossy fibers uh, provide position and velocity information, and why would the output be solely dependent on velocity? Why would you have all of these mechanisms that might be in place to essentially remove the the component of a signal that you're passing in? What's even more uh, sort of interesting to think about is that mossy fiber collaterals, of course, go to neurons in uh, the cerebellum nuclei. We're not sure in this particular task whether the same mossy fibers that we're recording the boutons of in the cerebellar cortex, whether those are the same uh, mossy fibers that are then projecting to a neuron in the cerebellar nucleus. But if you imagine that they were, uh, this presents even a, a sort of bigger puzzle in that now the inputs to uh, essentially the one stream, uh, one neuron downstream of the cerebellar cortex, those neurons, in this case, in the vestibular nucleus, are receiving mossy fibers that are position and velocity sensitive, predominantly position, and then uh, a signal from the uh, Purkinje cells that are that is velocity dominant. So even the, the nature of the inputs to these cells appears to be different. Um, so, you know, I, I have lots of ideas about why that might be the case, um, but I think that the ultimate goal of, uh, honestly, the cerebellum in this particular region in the flocular complex is really um, to uh, correct for aberrant slow eye movements. And what I mean by that is that this region not only is responsible for smooth pursuit eye movements, but is also uh, crucially responsible for the vestibular ocular reflex. The, the organization in the flocular complex 
um, sort of predominates pursuit responses in the ventral paraflocculus and a little bit more the vestibular ocular reflex in the flocculus proper, but really there's sort of a, a gamut of responses. And what's interesting about Purkinje cells in the, the uh, VOR task is that if the animal is performing uh, VOR in the dark, um, the, the responses of Purkinje cells or Purkinje cells are completely non-responsive, but of course, mossy fibers will be active. And so uh, the, the cerebellum in this particular region has essentially learned to cancel some uh, component of its input. And therefore, I think that the output computation of the cerebellum in this particular region really is a corrective signal. It is, here is what I have learned to need to do to make sure that my eyes move in a smooth pursuit fashion to, to reach the target. In the case of uh, VOR in the dark, there are no other signals that might be present um, to, that you would need a context of to increase or decrease the speed of your eye movement. And therefore the cerebellum has essentially learned to suppress its inputs. Very good. Um, a couple of people have raised their hand, Vincenzo. Hi, David, a very nice talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. My question is about the 3D autocorrelogram that sure. you were showing. And uh, it was not clear to me if you sorted them according to the firing rate of the cells or to the behavior. I know they correlate yeah. each other, but... Uh, so, so I use behavior just as an example. Um, we sort them based on the firing rate of the cell. Um, <laughs> so, so here, this, uh, this y-axis here is uh, quantiles binned according to... Um, the rate response at t equals zero, a, a smooth version of the rate response. So everything is based on rate. And, and part of the reason behind that is that some cells may be responsive to position, some cells may be responsive to velocity. We certainly don't want to, to make anything about the classifier in this part contingent on the behavior at all. Um, in fact, everything that I showed you at the end of the talk just falls out of uh, the responses of these cells uh, as we classify them. And we didn't use their responses during pursuit in any way to classify uh, these cells. So really this is agnostic to uh, behavior completely, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, and then you calculate this rate in a time window around certain behavior. Yeah, so we, well, we this is across an entire recording session. So there's no, no behavior here whatsoever. So, okay. so this has just been across an entire recording session, yep. Yeah, as an input to, uh, to your model, you gave like this uh, image. Exactly, and and then you use convolutional neural networks image classification, yeah. and it happily spits out that oh, that's a that's a unipolar breast cell, or oh, that's a mossy fiber. Very uh, clear. Thank yeah, you exactly. so much. Yep. Abby. Hi, David. This is so fun. Um, I'm not going to ask you about synchrony, even though I have about a hundred questions about it. But I instead wanted to ask you about the mossy fiber um, to granule cell sort of transition. So you you have um, illustrated that the mossy or sort of in imply that the mossy fibers are, you know, providing this this uh, velocity and position signal. And that's been shown nicely in the literature. Um, but I, I have a less of an intuition about how diverse those signals are. Like, are all the mossy fibers signaling those two parameters? Or is there a larger mix? And then, um, you know, it's sort of piggybacking on the the ideas of, of Mar and Albus about sort of uh, reformatting of if, uh, information entering the cerebellum by the granule cell layer, um, it seems like there's still this idea in this framework that the information is just being relayed. So could you could you sort of elaborate on what how you're thinking about um, whether there's a diversification of those signals or whether it's really just a, a relay? Um, yeah. So yeah. so I don't think it's so. I'll, I'll answer your first question first. I think. Um, which was about whether or not mossy fiber responses in this area are relatively homogeneous. Um, and in a general sense, they are. Um, in fact, they're, they're almost, uh, if, if you plot uh, the responses of these cells um, in their preferred direction, nearly all of them um, that we've recorded, uh, and I, we have about a hundred of them, uh, are position and velocity uh, responses. About two or three are visually responsive. That is, they respond to some things like retinal slip, but they represent a, a, an incredible minority. Um, and within these uh, this parameter space of position and velocity, um, they have relatively uh, homogeneous weights of position and velocity. 
Um, so, so really the mean curve that I showed you is really indicative of what the actual population is looking at. I will say that the one thing that is diverse about the mossy fibers is the direction of pursuit that they prefer. Um, so uh, mossy fibers tend to prefer pursuit along the primary axes, so vertically or horizontally. Um, but uh, you could record a mossy fiber next to another mossy fiber and they would have completely opposite preferred directions of pursuit, which is very unlike the, the Purkinje cells that we recorded. Um, to answer your second question, maybe, um, I don't think that they're simple relays, um, in part because I think a transformation has to be happening with them. Um, and I, what I view them as is uh, sort of little temporal filters. Um, and so essentially a very similar to, to you know, computationally the model that you guys proposed recently, where the granule cells essentially are uh, functioning like a, a sort of a basis set by which you can uh, expand and contract, uh, potentially integrate and differentiate uh, the responses of the incoming mossy fibers in interesting ways that you might then want to use uh, downstream uh, at the Purkinje cell. Um, can I ask a real quick follow-up about the mossy fiber diversity? So you, in the answer to the previous question, you had talked a little bit about, you know, VOR in, in this region as well. Like, do you think that if the animal was um, sort of free to move its head and do smooth pursuit, that, that then you would start to see these, like, Rich, a richer sort of information stream of mossy fiber input? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I would say that most of the time the mossy fibers are segregated um, to VOR versus uh, pursuit eye movements. So you might get a diversity at the granule cell where you're combining um, sort of position, eye position, eye velocity sensitive mossy fibers with VOR sensitive uh, mossy fibers. But without granule cells, I'm not sure um, if I could make complete predictions about whether or not those should be com completely uh, separate uh, granule cell populations or a joint population. My guess is it's probably a joint population. It's probably a smattering of all of them, um, but but that's just uh, my guess, uh, given that we haven't really reported granule cells in either of those tests. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Abby. Looks like there, I'm gonna jump in, I guess. Uh, if you can go back to the, um, uh, uh, plot that you were showing with regard to using spike waveforms. Um, um, my, my concern about it, David, was that, uh, as you know, um, for example, say a Purkinje cell, the simple spike waveform very much depends on whether one is recording it from the dendrites, from the soma, from the axon, and, and it, the, the entire waveform can mm -hmm. switch time. Um, yep. What do you think about that as a, as a variation in the information that uh, one has in the recording? So really it's, uh, no, it's fantastic. I've shown it here simplistically as simply the, the waveform on the primary contact because I wanted to give you the sense that there is uh, coherent information across waveform. But you're absolutely correct that if you look at, for instance, one of these Purkinje cells on an adjacent contact to the one that I measured, the waveform may look slightly different. And certainly it might look completely different if you're talking about the, the closer to the dendrites. Um, what, what's really nice is that those sorts of things are actually consistent um, across Purkinje cells, across a class of neurons. And so when you take advantage of machine learning, you can actually apply all of these individual signatures as a definition of a Purkinje cell. All it does is give you more confidence that this is a Purkinje cell. And so really the more views that you have of a Purkinje cell, the more waveforms you recorded across its, uh, say, dendritic tree or next to its soma, provides you with more and more evidence that this is, or provides, I should say, not me, but provides uh, a machine learning sort of neural network with more and more evidence that this is a Purkinje cell. Yeah, um, I guess to follow that up, you can imagine a, um, a, a many contact view of the same cell giving you the spike waveform at various locations along the cell, like you had for your 3D autocorrelogram. In this case, it would be a 3D measure of the waveform at you know at various uh, locations with respect to the cell. Exactly, and so so you can think of them that way. And, and we have um, done uh, models where it is sort of like this 3D spatial footprint uh, or, or waveform across um, across contacts. One thing that I would uh, say that one of the reasons we don't tend to do that anymore is because we're not guaranteed to get that sort of consistent. Um, 
uh, that consistent waveform across um, different recording sessions. What I mean by that is that sometimes you might be coming sort of orthogonal to the Purkinje cell, sometimes you're coming in line with the Purkinje cell, sometimes you're recording with a single electrode, sometimes you're recording with a multi-contact electrode. And so we take uh, the, the fact that you see a waveform simply as evidence that, uh, um, uh, that it is uh, the, the unit uh, that, it, that we're claiming, that network is claiming it to be. And so we try to avoid the across channel stuff only because it's sort of luck of the draw where you're, where you're recording and, and sort of some of these senses. But yes, exactly, uh, from the network standpoint, it's exactly, it's doing exactly what you're talking about. Any other questions for David? Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, hi, David. Hi, Sabi. Uh, thanks for this great talk. Uh, I have a question for the last part only. So sure. you attribute the velocity change only to granule cell tuning, uh, even though you have the many other cell types in the circuitry still, how you can exclude the other type cell type responses in that case? Yeah, so um, this was unfortunately where my internet happily cut out twice. Um, and so we're, we're sort of doing it via mentally mental exclusion. We try to identify locations that this transformation could happen, uh, and then via process of elimination, try to get to the point where uh, we're making sense of, uh, of uh, the responses of cells that we can't record, in this case, the granule cells. So our thought really was, was twofold. One, it seems to happen upstream of both molecular layer interneurons and Purkinje cells because MLIs are also velocity tuned. So either parallel fiber synapse on molecular layer interneurons and Purkinje cells in a manner that uh, similarly cancels position or, or the sort of Occam's razor, the simplest explanation might be that parallel fibers are just velocity tuned, which moved us back into the granule cell layer asking about Golgi cells or unipolar brush cells. Uh, Golgi cells don't appear to be functioning like feed forward uh, cancellation of position inputs, which really sort of left us at the granule cell. And then we use behavioral motor learning to really try to test that hypothesis without the ability to record from granule cells. Of course, yeah. if you could record from granule cells, this would probably be easy. Although I think as uh, Abby alluded to, uh, it might actually be very complicated um, from the standpoint of the population that you might see a lot of heterogeneous responses where you could form a basic set for just about anything. Yeah, great, thank you. Thanks, Samuel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, David, for that wonderful talk. I look forward to seeing everybody soon and uh, have a wonderful day. <laughs>